Okay. So please keep it quiet. So, so we said that sine is the car. We said that sine is the car. That we really need to understand is that in philosophy, in philosophy, in the beginning this kind of technical philosophical jargon, existence is identical. Many, many philosophical systems consider that existence is only possible as an identity. What does it mean? It's identity of what and what? Very now existence is identity. You shouldn't blank. Blank, blank. What the hell is he talking about? Black out, you know, like existence is identity. Great, it's the identity of what and what, essence and presence. When we consider that this chair exists, why do we consider it to exist? Because you see it. Is it only because you see it? What else? Huh? You can name it. You can. You know what it is. So we said last time that being, what you call existence, being, cannot be only said in one way. Being must be said in at least two ways. What are the two ways? Being must mean what I see, and it must mean also what I say. So when I say that this is a table, this refers to what? Presence or essence? Presence. presence. Table. Presence. Essence. So we said last time, if being only means presence, can you still say this is table? Why not? You don't know what it is? And would, would table mean nothing? If you say that being only means presence, does this mean that being doesn't mean essence? Anyone? No. I repeat. If you say being only means presence, aren't you also saying that being doesn't mean essence? Yeah. And if essence is not being, is it nothing? Yes. Okay? So this is why you cannot say that this is a table. Because you would be saying that being is nothing. Okay? I hope this is clear for everyone. Now you have to really be aware of these two poles, these two polarities of philosophical thought, classical philosophical thought, which are presence, essence. Presence is what you see, essence is what you understand. Now he says that really Descartes, Descartes' main angle of attack on the question of being is this one. What does it mean? It means that when Descartes says, I doubt existence, how can you now translate? If you're not a philosopher, you read, I doubt existence, you're saying, ah, oh, he doubts existence. He thinks that nothing exists, you know. But what does it really mean if you want to start grasping that technically you have control over this issue or question translate I doubt existence with presence essence there is no identity between presence and essence you went a bit too far in your translation what are you doubting I doubt the identity between it's not that I affirm there is no identity it means that I'm not sure that what I say about what I see is really the case. How are you getting that tiny difference? At last time, we've situated that in the history of thought because, please keep it quiet, because prior to Descartes, you had a kind of cataclysm whose name is what? It's like a hurricane, uh, not Aristotle. Who is the hurricane for Descartes? the guys that just made us see that 
we didn't understand anything so far. Galileo sank. Uh, Galileo, what did he say? Galileo just came out like that. He said, you know what? The, uh, he did it even worse than Copernicus. The Earth is round, it's spinning, it's not the center of the universe, the sun is spinning around the, the Earth, etc. While everyone, most of the people back then, believed exactly the opposite. So you see the sun move, and what Galileo tells you? It's not moving. So you see, now you have... What the, we used to think that for this image, for this presence, what was the essence? How did we understand it? We understood that the sun itself is moving. And now here you have Galileo that comes in and says, you know, you know what, you can do the same if the earth is spinning. It will look like as if the sun is moving, but it's not moving. It's the earth that is moving. This is the essence of that image. This is how you should understand that image. Okay? And now how, you see now how an essence can destroy a kind of appearance or a belief you have. The new way of understanding the movement of the sun in the sky destroys the way we used to understand the movement of the sun in the sky. All right? So you see, when Descartes says, I doubt existence, I doubt existence, it means, look, since Galileo, we shouldn't just believe in what we say about what we see. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. You say, ah, oh, it's blue. Maybe it's not blue. What do you know? Maybe it's waves or uh, I don't know what. Maybe it's an illusion. May we, we don't know. So you have to be very careful and doubt this correlation between what you see and what you say. Maybe what you consider is the case is not the case. Like, people used to believe that the earth is flat. You say, look, it's flat. And then we understood that it's not flat. So you see, your essence, the way you understand this image, changed radically. Actually, it's a sphere. It's what is most far away from flat. Okay? Now, last time we said that in the short version of the cogito, cogito, you know, I doubt, I think, I am. This is cogito in short. It says that Descartes doubts, you know, is it blue? We don't know. Is the sun moving? We don't know. Is it flat? We don't know. We can't really be sure. So he doubts. He doubts. You tell him, is this, uh, is this black? He tells you, well, maybe it's black. I don't know. Okay? So among all the phenomena that we see around us, walking, sleeping, eating, uh, talking, uh, white, blue, red, the sun is moving, horses, elephants, among all of these things, can you doubt the essence of all of these things? While you're walking, can you say, maybe I'm not walking? Yeah. When you are seeing the sun, can you say, maybe it's not the sun? Yeah. When you see water, can you say, maybe it's not H2O? Uh, tomorrow they tell us it's pure energy, or I don't know what. Yeah. So what is the only phenomenon in this universe that you cannot doubt? Doubt. Why you cannot? You see, here you have to be very careful. I repeat, can you doubt that the water is H2O? Yeah, yeah meaning you can destroy the way you understand. You, you say, ah, it's not H2O. Meaning H2O has a shaky relation to this image, the world. So when you, when you doubt it, you destroy it. So as I used to say, it's Poseidon. Today we say it's H2O. We don't know what will they say tomorrow. So the essence now is destroyed, the way you understand. So it might be something else. With doubting, what's the problem with doubting? Is that when you, when you doubt doubting, Shouldn't you have doubt again? Huh? Yeah. So can you get rid of doubt? No. If you say, I'm, I don't know if I doubt, what are you doing? Yeah. You're doubting. Now, we said last time, okay, whatever I do, if I want to suspend doubt, I need to doubt. Does this mean now that I know why I doubt or what is doubt? No. If I say doubt is blah, 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 you're not sure that doubt is that, but you're sure that there is doubt. I hope you're getting this there. If you say, I'm doubting because I want to learn, you're not sure of that, but you're sure that there is doubt. I hope you're getting this difference. 
I said that when you're sure of something without knowing why or what it is, this is what you call a certainty. Okay. Whatever I do, there is doubt. I don't want to doubt, I doubt. If I suspect doubt, I doubt. So whatever I do, there is doubt. But it's not true that whatever I do, there is H2O. Because maybe it's not H2O. Okay? But whatever I do, there is doubt. And this is what Descartes says in his discourse on method, the short text. He says, doubt is there. There is doubt. And hence, I know that I think. And hence, I am because there must be something that doubts. Short version. Clear for everyone? Now, I hope that you will remember this thought of a persistent determination. Whatever you do, you can't get rid of it. You can't suspend doubt unless you doubt. But you can suspend H2O, you can suspend I'm walking, you can suspend all of these things, but not doubt. So now let's move into the long version. So this was just warming up, you know. In philosophy is like you have a short version or a nice little story, you know, the cave, stuff like that, and then we begin the serious stuff. The serious stuff is in the meditations, not in the, med not on, not in the short book, the discourse on method, it's in the meditations, which is the major book by Descartes. In the meditation, Descartes' aim, as I've already told you, is really to reach a point where he can be sure of something. What does it mean, I'm sure of something? Not certainty now, it means that, not only certainty, it means that I know what it is and I'm sure that the essence and the presence fit together. This is the whole project of this book. He needs to be able to prove that for one thing in the universe, we can say that it's that and indeed it is that. For one thing, at least one thing. Because Descartes believes that if he can find this one anchor point, as Archimedes used to say, give me just one stable point and I will lift the universe up. So it's the same idea. The God is saying, just give me one being that we can call it by its name and I can demonstrate everything else. Okay? So Descartes, as you say, he begins his methodological doubt. And he begins with what is most obvious, what we call the empirical doubt. Now, what is methodological doubt? It means I'm doubting because I'm looking for the truth. What is the truth? The truth is when you have an essence that fits what? A presence. This is the truth. When you say it's blue, and really it's blue, truth. Methodolog methodological doubt is that. Let's doubt, not just for the sake of doubting, but to find or to try to find the truth, or at least to try to find that there aren't any truths. Empirical doubt is when you doubt about what you see. Empiricism is the empire of the senses, is what impresses you is the senses. Now, to make it short, this is empiricism. Empirical doubt, I'm doubting about what I see. So Descartes says in the opening of the meditations that I hope you will read, it's your first reading after your introductory, so maybe now it's your second reading. Uh, so Descartes says, are you justified to doubt about distant perceptions? Let's suppose you look at a tower from a distance and you think it's a round tower. Can it be maybe a square tower, but because it's very far, you see it as round? Yeah. Are you justified to doubt that? Yeah, so it's there. So, oh, it looks like a round tower. And how can you reassure yourself about the shape of the tower? What should you do? You should go there. When you go there, you see it's square, you say, oh. I was mistaken. What does it mean I was mistaken? For that presence, which essence did I give? Round. Round. When I got close, did I change now the essence? I said, ah, uh, square. I was mistaken. Okay. 
So, you, you know, with mirages and stuff like that, you have all kinds of situations where you see something, you, you think it is the case, and then when you get close by, you realize it's not the case. You know, like you see water in the desert, you run to drink, and there's no water. You say, ah, I was mistaken. Okay? Or you see someone in the street, you run and you hug him, and then he turns, uh, it's a stranger, so you feel a bit stupid, and you say, ah, he's not my friend. What does it mean he's not my friend? It means that for this presence, I thought it is my friend, but actually it's not my friend. There's another essence. So what Descartes is saying is very simple. He said, yeah, we, we are justified. We, meaning those who are looking for the truth, we are justified to doubt distant perceptions. Fine. But then Descartes, how do you reassure yourself by making them close? Hence Descartes says, yes, but what about close perceptions? Can I doubt that I'm sitting in this room? Can I seriously... Re do I have a reason to doubt that I am me and I'm sitting in this room? What would you be if you doubt that? Just like that, you know, out of the blue you say, yeah, but maybe I'm not sitting in this room or... I'm not myself, or now I'm flying on the moon. What would you be in this case? Really, now, do you believe that you are in this room? Yeah. yeah. Can you reasonably doubt that? Reasonably doubt that? Me. Anything justifies that you doubt that you're sitting on this chair here and now? No. If you did doubt that, let's suppose now one of you uh, has a crisis, he tells me... Uh, we are swimming, sir. We are swimming. What should, uh, who should I call? AUBMC. AUBMC. Hey, we have a nut guy here. Uh, come see you. I don't know what you have to do. Bring your pills and a straight jacket because he thinks he's swimming. Okay, so he's crazy, practically. If you really think now, really believe that I'm swimming, uh, you have a problem. Okay, so the God says in the text, he says, if while I'm sitting here, holding this paper, being Descartes, and meditating on the first truth, I believe that I am actually made of glass. This is the sentence he used. I believe that my body is made of glass. I would be a crazy person. I would be a crazy person. If I believe that I'm made of glass, I am crazy. Why am I, I am crazy? Because crazy people are people who are made of skin and flesh and bones who believe that they are made of glass without any justification. Crazy people, as Descartes says again, are people who are naked while they believe that they are kings. You know, crazy people at this time used to walk naked in the streets and stuff like that. And they believe they are kings dressed with uh, very fancy clothes. Okay? So Descartes is saying, He's saying, you know, only a crazy person would doubt immediate perceptions. And here you have a question, but am I crazy? Are you, am I crazy? Me who is looking for an, a certain truth. Me sitting in this room and looking for this anchor point from which I would lift the universe because I would have found one truth. Is someone looking for this truth crazy? If someone comes really, like one of you, say, you ask him, hey, what, what were you doing yesterday? He tells you, I was looking for an absolute truth. What would you think? Would you think that he's normal? No. No. So could a guy looking for an absolute truth, could he be suspected of madness? Yes. Yeah. Could a guy who tells you that he's sure that he's made of glass be suspected of madness? Yes. Yeah. You know, you know the judge Schreber? I don't think you know him. Schreber, Google him. He was a judge in the German court, like a judge, you know, like a guy who sits on a tribunal and judges people. And Schreber went crazy. And Schreber used to believe, by sheer coincidence, that actually he's a vessel of glass that irradiates light. Literally. 
And Schreber used to believe, and you have his diaries if you want to read the crazy people diaries, it's very entertaining at night. Schreber used to believe that actually they stole his nervous system and that the solar god took away his solar system and actually took, took away many of your many nervous systems from many people. And because now he is without a nervous system, he is a receptacle for the light of the god that is irradiating through him. And his mission on Earth is to uh, tell the people that they lost their nervous system too, but they don't know it. Okay, so he comes to you, he tells you, hey, listen, you think you have a nervous system, but actually uh, uh, the solar god has a stall in your nervous system. See, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting take. So, so this is what you call a madness. Now, what's the difference between Descartes who says, I want to find the truth, and Schreber who thinks that he's sure that uh, uh, someone stole his nervous system. Methodological, you have methodological doubt, you have crazy people, and you have septic doubt. Okay? So you have, have crazy people, and in doubt, you have what you call skeptic doubt and methodological doubt. Skeptic doubt, you doubt everything, just, you just doubt. Methodological doubt, you doubt the way to find the truth. <coughs> Crazy people, you know the truth without doubting it. So I repeat, when you're crazy, do you know that you are made of glass? Yes. Yeah. You say, I know that I'm made of glass, or I know that I am the life of God, or I know that I am the king. Is the God saying that he knows that he knows the truth? No. What is he saying? He says, we are not sure. The God is saying, I'm not sure that I am here, I am the God. And he's not saying, I'm sure that I am God or uh, a king or something else. Did you get the difference? Yes. Now, when you say, I'm not sure, but I'm looking for certainty, I'm looking for proofs to be sure, this is a skeptical doubt or a methodological doubt? Huh? The skeptic, what does he say? He says, I know that what? Nothing is sure. <clears throat> is the skeptical in a way part of an absolute truth? How, how come not? Does he know that nothing is true? So is this a truth for him? Yeah. So is he a bit crazy? Yeah. So you see, skeptics and crazy people, what is their problem? They believe in I know. The first one says, I know I'm God. The second one says, I know nothing is for sure. No, not yet. What is he saying? The guy says, I don't know. I don't know if there is something sure or nothing is sure. You get the difference. What the guy is saying is that so far I cannot really claim that I know something, be it that there is a truth or there are a did you get the difference between a crazy person and a rational person? If you say that, can you be crazy? Why not? Because you're not affirming something and you are methodologically looking for something that can be affirmed. Did you get the difference now? So, and here this is a very crucial point that you need to see in philosophy. If I tell you from the outside, from the outside, your friend is looking for absolute truth. Can you say that he's crazy? Yeah. yeah. Would he be like someone saying, you know, I'm uh, the sun god? Yeah. This guy, that, yeah. But if you look at the things now more carefully, your friend who tells you I'm looking for absolute truth, if he tells you, I'm looking for the absolute truth by methodologically considering cases to see if I can find the truth or I can find that there aren't any truths. Would he still be crazy? No. 
he gets a difference. From the outside, or sometimes you are looking for absolute truth, it sounds like I am God, or I can be God. This is why you can't confuse him. On the other hand, if you ask him, how are you looking for absolute truth? If you guys are looking for it methodologically, meaning without claiming anything so far, he can be crazy. Because if someone is requiring a proof for a statement, he's by definition rational. The crazy people are those who can affirm something without it. And this is my definition. You are rational if you are looking for a proof to affirm, and not you affirm without a proof. So Descartes puts aside the fact or the possibility that he is crazy. I hope now you understood how he did it. He has this process of thinking. I cannot be a crazy person while I'm looking methodologically for the truth. It's a contradiction in terms. I would be a crazy person if I already think that I know the truth or I think that I know that there aren't any truths. So how can you doubt, says Descartes, now that we've put aside the possibility of being crazy, how can you doubt or justify the doubt with close by perception? Is there an experience we have that can put in doubt the fact that I am here? Rationally put in doubt an experience, an empirical experience, that can make you doubt that you might not be here. Dreaming. Dreaming, great. Maybe you could be in a dream. You see, now he's not doubting anymore. Now, distant perceptions, we stood up its content. The close perception, what does it mean? It's content? It means it's as a Maybe, as a content, it's square and not round. With the close perceptions, can you doubt the content? Can you say, I'm not on the ground? You can't say that. Nothing justifies the statement. But what can you doubt now? The dream or the perception, meaning the modality of perception. Did you get the difference? We look at the tower and say maybe it's square itself. Here I'm not doubting that I'm on the floor. I'm doubting that maybe me and the floor we are in another mode of perception, which is the dream. And Descartes says, my human, my human condition, which makes me tired and then to sleep, makes me dream, and because I dream, I have good reasons to doubt of those perceptions. This is clear for everyone. How can you doubt the close by perceptions? Because you dream. Maybe it's a dream. Okay. I hope now you see how the card proceeds. With distant perceptions, you compare them to what? To close perceptions. Close perceptions, you, can, you, can, you compare them to what? To a dream. The dream you compare it to what? In the dream now, you are in a dream. Compare it to the end. You compare it to what? To? Descartes, I explained to you why. You compare it to art. Why to art? Because Descartes says, what is coming in the dream and in the most phantasmagorical creations? Is there anything coming between the dream and something which is absolutely out of the blue? Let's say a painter paints flying birds, dinosaurs, whatever you want. Do you find that in your dream necessarily? Or what is coming between the dream and what could be absolutely, let's say, the dream of another person? This is art. So I repeat the question. If you are an Eskimo, would you dream of the same things as if you are a Lebanese? If you compare the dreams or and ask him what would he dream about, usually? Eyes. Uh, eyes, why? Uh, Ignorance, uh, bears. What do you dream about? A loose. Ah, tapure. So, would an Eskimo dream about the tapure? It's a red. Okay? So, what is common between all the dreams? Are the shapes common among all the dreams? Are the shapes? What is the shape? A bear. 
dream what you know. You dream what you know. So as the shapes come into the dreams. No. Depends on the culture. Huh? Depends on the so as the shapes come into the dreams. No. Yes or no? No. The idea of an airplane, an Eskimo in the 17th century, it doesn't dream of airplanes. Okay? So what is coming among the dreams? Is there anything coming among the dreams? The color is saying. So among the dreams, what is coming is the colors. Please keep it quiet. So what is coming are the colors. Okay? Colors. Huh? Colors. Colors are coming to any visual thing. So I repeat, if you're looking at something in the distance, can you say, not that it's square or round, but that it's gray? Can you be more sure that it's gray than it's round or square? Yeah, you could be mistaken on the color, but the color is more sure than the shape. This is what he's getting. Why? Because aren't all visual images made of colors? Can you have a visual image which is not a color? No. No, even black is a color. So what is the cat saying? If you look what he's saying, he's saying, if you look at shapes at a distance they're doubtful, Close by, they are more sure. What is even more sure in the shape is what? It's the color. And what would be the colors which are absolutely sure? Uh, you look at green. Could it, could it be blue and yellow? Uh, do you know impressionist? Uh, uh, do you know the pointiest painters? You know the Sohab? Sohab. So Google Sohab. Sohab is a painter that paints with dots. Not that, yeah, he's close by the way, but he's a different uh, guy. He paints with dots, which are only the primary colors. He only uses magenta, yellow, blue, and black and white. And he only paints with dots. So, so uh, instead of painting a green lawn, he paints blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow. Now, when you are at a distance, what do you see? Green. When you get close by, what do you see? Blue, yellow. Now, can you have an illusion when it comes to green? Yes. Yeah. Can you have an illusion when it comes to yellow? No. No, why not? Huh? It's a primary color. It's in, it's in the, you can't decompose it. So what the guy is saying, in the visual field, what is the most asserted data? Primary color. But maybe it's not green, it's not like yellow, but if you see yellow, it's yellow. Okay? Shapes, are more doubtful than colors. Composed colors are more doubtful than primary colors. Primary colors for the visual field are what we can be the most sure of. Okay? Now we see how he's proceeding. He's saying, okay, the visual field, what can I be sure in the visual field? I can be sure of the primary colors because they are the conditions and the constituents of the visual field. So in the visual representation, meaning in what you see, what is the most ascertain, is the most elementary that makes possible this image. What makes possible in this image is actually what we can be sure of. In this image. You can do the same for sound, space, touch, etc. Doesn't matter. Okay? So the primary sounds, the primary taste, the primary feelings are the most certain sensations in their respective sensorial feet. Is this clear for everyone? Yes? Oh. So, colors, you end up with the elementary colors, which comes with conditions of what? Yeah, 
even this glue is actually made of the elementary particles mixed together. Whatever you see is made of the elementary particles. Question. Are there conditions for any representation? What are the conditions for the sounds? Are there the elementary colors of the world? Huh? Which, which audibles? So I repeat, you have to wake up. It's very easy. Visuals, what is the conditions and what makes any visual? Huh? The elementary colors. What makes any sound by analogy? Is there a current sound? Elementary sound. What makes what makes any taste? Elementary taste. What makes any feel? Elementary feel. Let's say for taste is sour and uh, sweet, or the feel is smooth and smooth. You can compose all the complexities of these sensory experiences with the elementary. Right? So the elementary is always the condition of a specific sensory feel. Is there a condition for any sensory feel, meaning a sound? or a visual, or a touch, or a smell, are there, are there general conditions for anything to be present to you? What are these conditions? It has to be in the simplest form. What do you mean simplest form? Uh, uh, huh? uh, yeah, elementary view. Is there something, a condition for the sound and the visual to be present to you? We said that for a visual to be present to you, it must have elementary colors. For a sound to be present to you, it must be made of what? Elementary sounds. Now, is there a condition for both? The combination. Is it a combination? Or you have senses, you have five. Is there something that is the condition of the five at the same time? So I'll give you the answer, it's complicated. For you to see anything, be it a sound, we get it there. Be it a sound, a smell, a touch, or anything. Should it be there for a while? Yeah. If I do this, do you see it? No. So should it subsist in time? So is time a condition for everything to be seen? This is the first condition, which is time. Second, when you see something, should it be different from you? That, can you consider that you are perceiving something if you think that this perceived thing is you? Is, are you still perceiving it? No. Is it clear? To perceive, to say, I see it, should it be not you? If it's you, do you say, I perceive it? Even your stomach ache, it's not you if you perceive it. You say, it's in my stomach. So there must be a kind of difference between what the perceiver and the perceived. Right? You can't perceive something by considering it to be identical to you. If it's identical to you, you're not seeing it. It's you. So the condition of perception being a sound, a color, a touch, a smell, is to consider that this thing that is being perceived is not you, is distinct from you. This distinction between you and the data that you are receiving or the stimulus, we call it space. There is a distinction between receiver and what emits the data. Is this clear for everyone? So if you hear a sound and you consider it not to be you, do you consider that you are being it? Yeah. Do you consider it then to be distinct from you or outside of you? Yeah. Is outside space? Yeah. There's you inside, outside. So you consider that it's different, it's in space. So what is the second condition for anything to be perceived? Space. And when you perceive, do you attribute for it immediately without thinking a number? Be it a sound, a touch, a smell, or whatever you are dealing with. When you see a chair, is it one chair? Yeah. When you see two chairs, are they two chairs? When you look at pieces of the chair, are they pieces? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five pieces. Can you see something without numbering it? No. So 
What is the third condition of any perception? Number. You see, number, space, and time are the conditions of what? Of any perception, any representation. If you dream, do you have space, time, and number? You dream about, you know, mutton's jumping uh, about the fence. Do you number that? Yeah. Yeah, they have number. Do you, why do you dream and consider that it's another perception? The dreamer, you know, when he's seeing, does he consider that this is something he sees? So you have space in the dream. And does he see it for a while? So you have time even in the dream. See, space, time, and number, they cross all representations. Imagine a world from outer space. Try to imagine it without space, time, and number. Can you do that? Anyone? Imagine the most incredible world. Try to imagine the most incredible world. Wouldn't it have space, time, and number? It would. Why it will have for sure space and a number? Because it won't exist. Huh? It doesn't exist. It's not exist. It won't be perceived by you. So let's suppose you want to imagine. Let's try to imagine now a world that doesn't have space and a number. What would you imagine? A white canvas. A white canvas. Does it have space and a number? A white canvas. Is, yes. it, is it different from you? Yeah. Do you see it for a while? Is it one behind us? So you have space now and then. Anyone wants to try to imagine something without you? We see ourselves infinitely for a second. Unless we're like an amount of time. No worries. You see yourself uh, flying like a uh, particle. Is it one particle? <laughs> Is it different from you? Did you see it for one second? Space now and then. Actually, you cannot. They can't say it. Try it. Try it for the whole being. Try to imagine something which is not space time. You will put on it space time. You will present it to yourself as space time. Because these are the conditions. If you don't have space time, number nothing can appear to you as an image, whatever you do. So, what is even more fundamental than the elementary colors is space, time, and number. These are what we call the general conditions of any representation. Hence, can you be sure of these for you? And you look at the tower there. The shape is doubtful. We don't know the circle or the square. You would be more sure about the color. We say it's color and it's green. Wouldn't you be even more sure if you say it's just there? Which statement is more a circle? Just there. Wouldn't you even be more sure if you say, oh, it's one package? Yeah. And if you say, it's, I'm seeing it for five seconds? Yeah. You see, the statements which deal only with space, space time and number are the most assertive statements when it comes to our empirical and any representations that we can deal with. Yes. yes. Okay? I hope this is clear for it. Space and another is what you can be really assumed of when it comes to how you, you see things. Because you cannot see without this. So you are sure that you have these in whatever you see. You close your eyes, you hear a sound, it's different from me, space for a while, one sound, space and a number. So you are certain of these. But you have a problem. I believe that space, time, and number, this is really like part of whatever I can see. But now can I be sure that the world has space, time, and number? Did you get the difference? In me, I look at this room, it seems to be in space, time, and number, at least. Can I be sure that the room itself, the material room that is beyond my perception, is also having space, time, and number? Space and number stands for what? Essence or presence? Essence. 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 So these are the most essential determinations. But can you really be sure that they fit the presence? Not to our vision. No, in itself. Our vision, we're sure that our vision is space and number. 
but can you be sure that there is space outside of you? Like the same here is actually spatial. Can you be sure of that? No. You read uh, what is called Hawkins? You know Hawkins, he yes. died recently. You read the universe in Yes. So what is he saying practically to, to summarize it brutally? He's saying what you see around you is a huge space, maybe it's where, sitting where in a nutshell. Have you seen uh, men in black? Yes. Yeah. Men in black. Fine. So they're looking, you know, the first version, not one, two, three, the one. I didn't watch two, three, and now there's a four. So in the number one, they're looking for a lost universe. Where did they find the universe? You remember? Where was it hidden, the universe? In the necklace of a cat. You know, you know the necklace of a cat. They found the cat, and actually, in the necklace of the cat, when you look in, you see a universe. Okay. So what uh, what am I saying? I'm saying this. This room looks like four meter. Can I be sure that in itself is four meter? Maybe it's only appearing to me four meter. Is it clear? Maybe I'm in some kind of tweaked world where what seems to be big is actually tiny, 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 or maybe uh, not even spatial. Nothing guarantees, nothing guarantees that what is valid for me is actually the case outside of me. Is this clear? For you to see anything fine, you need space time and number, but you can't be sure that this applies to something outside, really in itself outside of you. Maybe there's no space or time or number for people who are different from us or for the world itself. The world itself might be not spatial, temporal, and Number. Maybe number is the way we simplify things, space is the way we perceive things, time is the way we uh, apprehend these representations. I hope this clash is clear. In philosophy, this is fundamental. This is what we call the for us. For us is like that. And this is what we call the in itself. In itself, we don't know. Okay, for us, in itself. Presence, essence in our land. So the presence and essence both fit. So far they don't fit. Now the God says, if I'm not sure about my essences as fitting the presences, I'm not sure, obviously. Am I the master of the correlation between essence and presence? I repeat the question. Are you sure that now the world is faster temporal and number or not? Are you sure about that or not? The world, the in itself. Are you sure that the in itself has space, time and number? Yes. No. no. For, us. For you, you see things in space, time and number. Nothing proves that these things themselves are spatial, temporal number. Is this key for everyone? For you to see something, it must be space time and number. Nothing proves that the world itself is space time and number. Hawking's, men in black, just to give you images, maybe the world is actually one dot. You don't know. You see it extended and stuff like that. It doesn't prove that it is the case. Okay? I hope this is clear. So, are you the one who controls the relation between essence and presence? If you are doubting the relation between essence and presence, are you the one controlling it? Yeah. If you are doubting it, are you controlling it? Mm -hmm. If you are not sure if this fits that, are you the one who makes and are master of this relation? No. No, thank you. When you are not sure of something, I mean, let's suppose you are not sure if it will rain. Are you, are you the rain maker? Very simple. No. If you are, please, keep it, please can you move? Please move uh, here. <laughs> okay. So if you're not the rainmaker, you are not sure if it's gonna rain. If you are the rainmaker, are you sure it's gonna rain? If you are the really the one who makes the weather, you can be sure. Okay? So this is what the God is saying. He's saying, I'm not sure about this correlation. I'm not sure about this correlation. And given that I'm not sure about this correlation, what can, what can I be sure of now? That we're not the one who controls it. That I'm not the one doing this correlation, or who created it, or who controls it. Huh? 
This correlation can be called existence. What is existence? It's the correlation of essence and presence. So are we the masters of existence? No. If we are not the master of existence, there must be someone else who is the master of existence. Is it clear how he's reasoning? If you're not the one doing this correlation and you're the master of existence, it means that there must be someone else. We're getting there. Who could be the someone else? It could be either God or not God. Other, other logical possibility. Either it's God or not God. Meaning either it's the perfect correlator or the not God, what would it be? If God is the perfect correlator, correlator what would be the not God? The imperfect correlator. See, it's very logical. If I'm not the one doing this correlation because I doubt it, someone else can do puzzle or can do it, which is either God or not God. Not God, let's call it nature for practicality. So either God or nature. If you tell me, yeah, but nature is perfect, it is not. We're not arguing about that. It's clear. So either it's a perfect cause or an imperfect cause that makes it. What does it mean? When I'm walking in the room, when I'm walking in the room, we will suppose that there is a material counterpart that is really walking in the room in itself. A material piece displaced in space. This is me. And at the same time, what am I seeing? I'm seeing images changing while I'm walking. Is this clear? Okay. What is the God saying? The God is saying, I'm not sure that what I'm walking, these images, I'm not sure if they really correspond to the material thing happening outside of these images. Because we have access to these images. I'm not sure if this, they're coordinated in a perfect way. This is clear. I'll give you another example. If you have a camera, Let's, just, let's say the camera had a delay, you know, when you speak on Skype. Mm -hmm. here on Skype, when your friend does that, okay, he, he does that. And it comes three seconds later. He's talking about that, he's saying, what guarantees that the movements in the reel are immediately and perfectly translated into images that I see? Right? So the guy says, the one who makes this correlation, be it on the level of perception, knowledge, or whatever you want, it's either perfect or imperfect. So if it's God, which is absolutely perfect, incredible, wonderful, the one and only, that is doing this creation. Creation, why? Because if you are putting together essence and presence, are you creating existence? Yeah. So if God is the perfect creator, is he powerful enough to create something beneath his power if he feels like it? Yeah. Okay, let's suppose you are an incredible engineer. Can you make a Ferrari or a Volkswagen? Yeah. You can make both. So let's suppose God is, uh, has a black humor and he feels like entertaining himself with some humans and he creates us as believing in space time and number where actually there is no space time and number in the universe. And he's really laughing like each time. He's laughing at us, speaking about it, thinking about it. And he's entertaining himself with these clouds which are trying to know the reality. Okay? Is this a possibility? Yeah. yeah. Because if you are super powerful, can I put it back on? Five minutes. <laughs> so if God is super powerful, he can create a false mind. He can. He can create someone like me, or believing that he's here talking, etc. Well, actually, all of that is a fake. Is a program somewhere or I don't know what in the end. Okay? Okay, I hope this is clear. Okay. In reality, in itself, we can create a disjunction between what we see and what is going on. Okay? Like a bad camera or a bad sinking camera. Why? Because he's super powerful. So do we have reasons to doubt? To doubt? The correlation between essence and presence, if God is the master of this correlation, yeah. yeah. Do I have 
reasons to doubt the correlation between essence and presence if the imperfect creator is the correlator. Yeah. Why not? Because it's imperfect. If it's imperfect, could you have a bad correlation? Yes. Yes, why yes? You're going to do something better than that. It's not because you could. Could he make mistakes if he's imperfect? Yeah. Yes. yes, by definition. It's clear. So if it's nature or God, the correlator between what you see and what is happening, do you have good reasons and rational reasons to doubt? Yes. Huh? Yeah. Yes. You see, you have very good reasons to doubt because if he's perfect, he can be playing with you. And if he's imperfect, he could be making mistakes. You see, it's blue, it's not blue, you know, it's program is buggy. It's like when you don't download videos and stuff like that. You put plates, start moving like that. And it's a bad image, and actually what you see is a very bad image of what is happening out there. So do you have now a certain reason to doubt even your space time and number? Yeah. Now, if you're rational, you should say, I don't know. Is it clear? Should you say this is in space if you're rational now? No. Should you say that this is blue? No. Should you say anything? No. And this is where the famous evil genie comes in. Now, who is the evil genie? The evil genie is the habit to believe in things, in the God. Now, let's suppose you turn and you tell your friend, give me water. Did the evil genie trick you? Huh? So you turn and you say, give me water. Did the evil genie trick you? Why yes? Why yes? Because you believe that he's your friend, that he's there, and you want water, and that this is what. Now, Descartes says the evil gene is a habit that makes us transgress the limits that our reason is putting for us. What are the limits that now reason has traced for us? Should you say anything about anything? No. This is really like the limit. You shouldn't. That. You shouldn't believe in anything. You shouldn't believe in anything. You shouldn't make statements about anything, even anything. Even you, who you are, etc. You have proven that you shouldn't make any statement that this is the case. But then you can genie all the time make you make statements. You say it's you are here, but fine. So let's suppose you say it's blue. Then you realize, oh my god, I shouldn't have said that. Do you know now that you are betrayed? If you say, if you say, I believe it's X. And then you realize that you shouldn't have said that. Do you know that you are betrayed? Yes. Anyone? Yeah. Why do you know that you are betrayed? Because? Yeah, no. Not? No, not because you're mistaken. Because you believe, and should you believe in anything? No. It's not because you saw this blue and it appeared to be red. Not that at all. This was before. If you say it's blue, even if, even if it's blue, you shouldn't believe it's blue. It's clear. You shouldn't say the essence corresponds to the presence because either God or not God are the correlators, and in both cases you should doubt. You didn't prove yet, yet a way out of this down to burn relation. So you can't say it's blue. Uh, if you say it, the evil genie tricked you, meaning this is bad habit, we have to all the time believe everything. This is the evil genie. And if you say, I believe it's X, does this mean that I am betrayed? Yeah. Why? Because you shouldn't believe. But now if you say, I am betrayed, didn't you believe that you are betrayed? Yes. Yeah. So you said, I believe I'm betrayed. So if you believe you're betrayed, are you betrayed? And when you're betrayed, are you betrayed? Yes. So can you get rid of betrayal? You see, you're betrayed whatever you do. If you say, it's blue, you're betrayed. And then if you say, oh my God, I'm betrayed, what are you? You're betrayed. And if you say, I don't want to be betrayed, you're betrayed. Okay? So whatever you do, you are betrayed. 
So betrayal is what? Betrayal is an insistent determination. Yeah? If you say you are here, you are not betraying yourself. Like right now. If I say I'm here, am I not betraying myself? You believe you are here because you see things in space time and number and you're sure you are here. Does anything prove that indeed in matter, let's call it like that for the time being, there is a room and you are in the room? Could you be in a simulation? Yes. Maybe. Maybe, but could you? Could you means maybe. Could you be in a simulation? Maybe. Maybe means could. Uh -huh. Yes, I could. Be. Is it a possibility? Is it a maybe to be in a simulation? Yeah, so can you be sure that you are in a real room? No, I can't be sure. You can't be sure. So when you say I'm in a real room, aren't you betraying yourself? Yes. Yes, so this is why you shouldn't say I'm in a room. So let's suppose now you say, oh my god, I'm betrayed. Sh should you say that? No, no, it's not right. <laughs> can, you be, can you be sure that you are betrayed? Is betrayal an essence? Yes. Yes. Can you be sure that there is a presence that has this predicate which is betrayed? No. Predicate means blue, red for a chair. Can you say me plus betrayal is happening out there? It's the same as I'm in the room. Is it clear for everyone? Yeah. Betrayal is a determination. It's like I am betrayed. Like I am blue. The difference between blue and betrayal is that, that blue you can get rid of it, but betrayal you can. Because when you're betrayed, you're betrayed, and when you're not betrayed, you're also betrayed. This is clear. You see, this is what they got. This is an insistent determination. Whatever you do, there is betrayal. And even there's nothing in this universe, because everything is doubtable. What is there for sure all the time? Betrayal. Betrayal. So you can imagine the cat screaming in the wilderness, in the black universe. I'm betrayed, I'm betrayed, I'm betrayed. And each time he says it, actually he's even more betrayed. And he can't get out of this betrayal. Betrayal is the origin of the universe. Betrayal is the first thing that we can be sure of. And this is when betrayal turns itself upside down. If I'm betrayed, am I something? Do I exist if I'm betrayed? Or is there betrayal? Yeah. We didn't they prove that there's a correspondence, but there is something. And this something is this voice screaming, I'm betrayed. Betrayal is the first deed. And you know that now. How does the story begin? Our universe, how does it begin? Adam and Eve, what do you say? Who they betrayed? God. Adam and Eve, they betrayed God, and they themselves betrayed themselves. So you know, it's not that he's that crazy. The Bible says it textually. How do you begin the natural world? You begin with the betrayal. The betrayal of what? The betrayal of God. What does it mean, the betrayal of God? It means that you go out of the perfect correlation of essence and presence. This is how the world begins. The world begins when human beings then cut in half essences from presence. Because when you were in paradise, Adam and Eve, for them everything had a name and its name used to fit what it was. You know, God dealt uh, with Adam's names, all the Adams and everything. It means that he gave him all the essences of what? Of all the presence. And the betrayal was what, if you want to read it philosophically, the betrayal was to go out of this correspondence between the essences and presence, and this was the betrayal. And when you get out because they wanted to be feelings, they wanted to say whatever about whatever, they betrayed and they were lost. You know, they ate from the tree of knowledge, which is actually the tree that made them oblivious of the knowledge. And they were sent into nature. What is nature? Nature is a place where we're not sure. You have a clash between what you know and what you see. You're not sure anymore. So now we have this persistent determination, and I'll stop here. And at least we know, each time you betray, what do you know at least? That there is someone. You can't call it someone, but there is something which is the betrayed being. You see, the betrayed being is not Descartes anymore. Descartes is someone who was able to reach the betrayed being as the first being. With his intellectual speculation, he knows that what comes before Descartes is who? 
is the betrayed being. He's not saying Descartes is betrayed. He's saying there is betrayed in this universe. And this is the first being with which the universe begins. We'll see next time now how do you make sense of this betrayed being and how will you be able to reach back to this lost paradise which is that place where essences and presences used to shift together. Please read the reading. So at the end of each chapter you have a number in the bracket. You look at the end of the booklet, you have a number under nine. This is what you have to read. Okay? So...